Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is Jeremiah it's J Man Monero with J Man Seminars, and I'm here with my good buddy Brent Lancaster from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Bob Brooks School. That's like a tongue twister in itself. That is um, a lot. <laughs> we're talking about social media ethics today. It's a little bit different. We're going to call this uh, J Man's Ed Talks, where we're just going to casually have a conversation about any hot topic that we want. And today it's social media ethics. So, Brent, you want to start us off? What are, what are we going to talk about today? Well, uh, you tell me. We're going to talk about social media ethics. What what are the what are the major issues? I mean, we live in geographically. We're in two totally different parts of the globe. Um, but I, I think some of the issues. I'm curious to find out if the issues that you're having in your market and that we're having, uh, kind of in our world, are the same, particularly as it relates to uh, social media. I mean, social media, does social media operate outside of the code of ethics? And, and I think there's a big, there's a big debate that's going on. I mean, cause people have, uh, MLS rules. So you have your MLS rules and regulations. Does social media fall within those MLS rules and regulations? And in addition to that, if they don't, do they fall within the code of ethics and uh, ethical violations? And then, of course, you can throw in the law. What's the legal implications of it? So that's what I'm curious about. And then and if that's not what you want to talk about. We can talk about something else. I don't know. I can draw a picture. <laughs> no, absolutely. That's what we want to talk about. But then, but then also, you know, the flip side of that is the business side of it is a lot of people care about. Why, why am I on social media? How does it help me in my business? And I think sometimes one gets confused with the other where they, 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 they try to ride that gray area in the hopes that it's going to help them get business when in the long run it could be de detrimental to their career um we got somebody who has no sound cj try turning on your speakers i would think or try logging out and logging back in if you're having any other uh, problems yeah all right probably the best way to view this is with no sound i think that's probably a <laughs> get the most quality back for your buck yes. Try to read our lips and see if you can. I'll try to talk slower. What, I have a white one. I can just write on the whiteboard. Um, for my end, I, I know what we're seeing in New York State, which is it's been an ongoing problem and an emerging issue, and an, it's a current issue now, with agents, you know, sharing listings. And what I mean, not their own listings, which obviously is okay, but it may not be even a best practice for social media, but you know, sharing other agents listings. So I, I go into my MLS in the morning and I say, man, look at this one. This is a great, you know, you always see that listing. Like this is a great listing. You know, it's something yeah. people would like to click on. It's got great photos. Maybe it's priced right. It's an area it's sought after. They take that and then they share it to their social media and say, Hey, what a great house. If you'd like to see it, let me know. Are you guys seeing that sometimes too? Yes. Uh, and, 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 some MLSs don't do you any favors in the fact that there is within the MLS, there's an icon that says share to social media. So it, that in and of itself, you can, with one click, just go ahead and share that. So I, I think, you know, and, and I understand from an MLS's standpoint, how they want to get that out there. But, um, I, and from an agent standpoint, I, I think a lot of times agents don't, don't realize what they're doing is unethical and, and that doesn't make them a bad person. That just kind of makes them, Oh, well, look, look, I accidentally forgot. And I think uh, people do things uh, the wrong way for the right reason. And, and that's really what happens. If they see a good listing, they really want to promote it. They can click a button and post it out there. The question that I have for you is in there, I want to jump in their shoes for a second. I'll play contrarian. Yeah. But if, if you're the listing agent, and I'm looking at your listing and I think it's fantastic. Why wouldn't you want me to share it? I think a lot of agents get territorial and I love talking to, to people about this. Agents are saying, well, it's my listing, it's my listing. And my question to you as a buyer's agent that's trying to promote your listing, wouldn't your seller want that promoted? Well, as a seller's agent, well, as a yeah. Seller's agent, yeah. I mean, that's that's the question that I have is, is if, I think, uh, and, and that's really the, the the pushback that I get when I bring up the question, the kind of sharing from social media, the, the buyer's agents like, well, uh, they should thank me for promoting their listing because I'm choosing their listing among the thousands that are in MLS in order to promote. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, I think 
you know, always err on the side of caution. If, if it were me, I would just contact the listing agent and say, hey, Brent, you got a great listing here. Can I share it? And you, you'd be like, you want to get the listing sold. Why wouldn't you just say, yeah, sure. Got no problem with it. You know, and, and I, I think, think that's the missing piece. I, I think the missing piece is that simple conversation. And there are some boards that, that uh, across, across at least my state where they're putting in, uh, in the agent remarks, realtor remarks, whatever field that you have, agent notes, whatever that may be, uh, that yes, this is a shareable listing. Feel free to share that sort of thing uh, where they're basically giving you written permission. So that's becoming a little bit more common. Uh, I know that there's two boards in my state that do that. Uh, my, and uh, just, just to give people permission. Yeah. I want you to go ahead and promote that. So I, I think it's, it's, at a minimum, that conversation needs to take place. That's where I was trying to go with that. Yeah. So I think as a listing agent, it's definitely a good best practice. Like you said, in the almost all MLSs have that private remark section where you could just say, Hey, this is blanket permission for anybody and everybody who's a member of the MLS to share this everywhere that you want. We don't have a problem with it. I know, you know, I do a lot of live videos from my listings that are coming soon or when they just hit the market and in my, in my verbiage, I say, Hey, everybody, if you're looking at this, feel free to share it across anywhere. It doesn't matter to me, you know, as long as you can get it out. And if you're an agent, I'm happy to show it to you. If you're a buyer, an unrepresented buyer, I'm happy to show it to you as well. You know, if it's something that's off market, that's going to be coming soon. And that's the whole, and that's the whole promotion aspect of it. So my phone dinged and now I can't find it under my glob of paperwork. So excuse me. <laughs> Well, let's talk about coming soon because that seems to be a hot topic with the sellers that's all across the country. That oh, yeah. How how are you handling the coming soon's? And I'll tell you how we're handling up here in, in New York. It's it's different. I think it's different per market. Um, we got uh, you and I were talking about um, um, uh, two different markets. I mean, literally. 60 miles apart. We have uh, low inventory. So I'm in Baton Rouge. We have relatively low inventory. It's, it's, it's moving a little bit more, but for the most part, we still have low inventory, 60 miles. It's a buyer's market. So we have two totally different, uh, two totally different markets. And, and we've got a, a town uh, or at least a area uh, that's directly tied to oil. I mean, their, their economy is tied to the price of oil. We, we kind of have oil down here just in case you didn't know that. Uh, and, and this market really is. So when the price of oil dropped, the economy kind of got a little, a little testy there for a little while. Um, and, and in Baton Rouge, I'm not going to say we're insulated, but, uh, we're, you know, capital state government, we've got LSU, which is a major university. So we have a little bit more, um, uh, industry here, uh, that's not tied. We still suffered to some degree, but my, my point is, it's interesting to see the, the coming soon discussion because it's a hot topic nationally, but it's a hot topic because most of the markets that are having it are coming soon. What I'm interested to see is when it's no longer a seller's market, how these coming soon rules are going to shift that are in favor of the buyer. And, and, and so it, it's really interesting to watch, to listen to sort of these committees talk about this because they're approaching it as if it's going to be a seller's market forever and a low inventory forever. Well, when the market changes, these rules largely might hurt uh, in the long run. But to answer your question, I don't know that they're addressing in our market, they're not addressing coming soon's directly. There are rules and certainly there's, there's time limits and time frames relative to coming soon. But again, these are MLS rules. They're not social media rules. So if right. I post a coming soon on social media and I have a certain amount of time either to get it into MLS or to make it active in MLS, social media largely works independently of, uh, of the MLS. So it's, that's an interesting, um, it's an interesting discussion that they're not sure how they can regulate. How are y'all addressing it up there? <laughs> well, I can tell you uh, in all parts of the state and we actually have our, our state presidents locked down right now. We have another, a director of training for Douglas Element, which is a huge company, yeah. 7,000 agents, something like that. Jeffrey Scott, um, and maybe he can chime in here in a little bit, but it's the wild, wild west in some parts of the state yeah. where it's somebody puts something coming soon. 
and you know the right way to do it would be they have an exclusive listing sign right because if you if i put a sign in the yard and it says coming soon i've just told everybody that this seller is thinking about listing sure. but they haven't yet so everybody could approach them but you know having that exclusive sign and then making sure that agents and potential buyers all get in at the same time Correct. you know we 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 have had complaints about okay the agent calls and they said okay well the house isn't going to be ready or it's not going to be shown until saturday at 9 a.m but then that yes. buyer calls and says hey can i get in there and the agent says sure we'll get you in today right now and so i think that's what's hurting us just as an industry as a whole that's i mean it's a huge issue because they're getting two different stories as their buyer's agent they're supposed to trust me because i have a fiduciary duty with them right they call me i, I say hey we can't get in till saturday and now they call this other agent who tells them something different and who are they they kind of hurts us all i i think that's where that that's the biggest problem is you're looking a, a, a coming soon i think can be a very good um, marketing strategy from a listing agent. And I always call it the double dip. You, you sort of have the momentum from, Hey, this property is about to come on the market. And then you take another dip at the apple when it actually becomes active where you run into problems. And again, bringing social media back into this is when you post, Hey, I've got this great listing, these wonderful sellers. They're the nicest people in the world. Can't wait to show you this property. It'll come on the market soon. And then you've got some unrepresented buyer that contacts you and says, look, I'd really like to look at this property. And as a listing agent, it's very difficult to say no, but that you, there's no other way to put it. You have to, I mean, if you show one, you have to show everybody and it's hard to have that conversation. And I, I get where agents are coming from because it's hard to go, no, you can't see it today. And then go back to your seller and say, somebody wants to come and look at it. And I just told them, no, I mean, what is, what seller's going to go? Oh, well, that's okay. You know, so you, you really have to talk to your sellers about this and, and it has to be a strategy. I mean, you look at, at, at um, there's some parts of Dallas, uh, you look at some parts of DC, you look at Nashville, coming soon is a legitimate strategy in terms of the, the inventory is so tight there that they say, look, we're going to have all showings from, right. you know, 6.30 to 8.30 on Wednesday and then submit all offers. So that as a coming soon strategy is good because nobody can enter into the property Right. And those are unique markets. Uh, we don't have those in Louisiana, we're but seeing, we legitimately have people. What's that? We're seeing that in New York. We do that. And, and and I think it's excellent. I mean, I'd love to be a listing agent in that, in that world. But at the same time, I was in, uh, I, I was in Lake Charles. What's today? Friday. I was in Lake Charles Wednesday and, and uh, you know, they're in a, they're in a tight inventory market as well. And we had this discussion where if you list a property, should you list it as coming soon or should you just make it active? And you know, my recommendation is wh whatever you do to one, you have to do to all. So you can't just, and I was teaching at a company and you can't just show the agents in your company. You can't just show unrepresented buyers. You can't just show just your buyers. Um, and when you think about it from a fiduciary standpoint, wouldn't, wouldn't it benefit your sellers for everybody to take a look and for everybody to get a bite at the apple? Right. Yeah, we, we do that here where if, like, let's say I do a coming soon video on Monday. I'll say, look, it's going to be listed on Friday. Any unrepresented buyers can contact us. We'll get you in on Friday. Any agents yeah. let me know. We'll get you in on Friday as well. All at the same time. Um, and, and then we have some other agents who will do that, but then they say, okay, it's listed on Friday. We have group showings Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then all offers will be reviewed on Monday, which, which is a, another position to take. And that's a whole nother conversation. But I never like to do that because as educated and as much of an expert I am in real estate, it's still a guess. You know, oh, I, yeah. I'd like to think every property is going to sell, you know, first weekend, multiple offers, but not every, you know, we have a seller's market, but there's still houses if they're not priced right and just in the right condition for the. So I just imagine if I put that in the listing and then it's crickets, <laughs> I don't have any oh, offers. Yeah. I mean, you know, the market might reject your house and that's no fun. And that's, that's a hard position to go back and go, well, you know, the market's really not responding how we wanted to Mr. Seller. I know, I've, I know I said we'd have multiple offers, but we only had one showing right. <laughs> and here's the feedback. And it's just, uh, you know, it's terrible. Well, go ahead. You gonna say something? 
No, I mean, it's, it's, it's an issue that needs to be addressed and, and it, it's, it, it's going to take, uh, discipline and it's going it, to, it, the, when you start making, um, uh, when you start deciding who gets to see and who doesn't get to see a listing, that is an exceptionally short-sighted approach. That's all I'll say. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, then let's say on the, uh, you know, as we have multiple offers and, and somebody wins and then there's always multiple people that lose out, right? In that, in that kind of a scenario. Or I don't like to say that they lose. We freed them up to have the opportunity to choose another house of their dreams, <laughs> is what I like to say, because they always end up saying, oh, that was for the best, you know. Yeah. They use all the cliches in the book that, you know, more times than not, they are happy. They are happy. Things happen for a reason. But some something happens, they're unhappy, the buyer's unhappy, the agent's unhappy, and then they go to social media and complain. Right. Right. They say, well, you know what? We got screwed on this deal that this wasn't, you know, and that's another big problem because it's not, it's not like you're going to, like, if I have a complaint about real estate, I go to my wife and I complain and then she tells me to be quiet and handle it. And then that's it. That's the end of it. Right. Like rather than go to this open forum where everybody's watching, that out, yeah. you know, it's, it's not just real estate agents. It's everybody. It's the public. It's the consumers. I think that's another big issue for us that if something happens and we feel that things weren't handled correctly, like go through the proper channels, don't go to social media and complain about other agents or the, or the transaction or feel like you got slighted because now the consumer sees this and they think we're just cheating each yes. other out of business, you know, and it's that dog. Well, I think it's, that's a conversation to have with your, with your buyers too, because a lot of times, that starts, that doesn't originate necessarily from the agent that may originate from the buyer. And, and, and I think that's a counseling issue that you can talk to your buyers and, and it's a conversation. And my conversation goes like, there's not one single thing that you can say on social media that is going to help you in negotiating, not one, because if you lose this deal and you say you got screwed, then the next deal that we submit on, they're going to stalk you via social media and you're going to be a problem to work with because here you are complaining about all the other deals. So when it comes to our real estate search and I tell this to buyers and sellers, shut your mouth. Socially, there's not one thing you can say that can positively affect your negotiating position because any good agent and any reasonable buyer or seller is going to come find out what you have to say. So they'll, they want to know why you're selling, why you're buying, you know, all those things right there and they're going to do their research. So what happens is whether it's a buyer or an agent that posts that it's a lot of times when, when we see uh, code of ethics issues, it's not the original post. It's the comments that follow in the post, you know, where, Oh, I got screwed on this deal and somebody else chimes in. Well, he's a bum anyway. And then, so that may be between two consumers, but the second an agent or a broker likes that comment or engages in that comment, you cross the line, in my opinion, and in the opinion of some some uh, uh, boards as well. So, so what would be some best practices? Best like you said, in, I know when I sit down with the buyers that I'm working with, I tell them again, like just like you said, to be off the social media, don't don't talk about it. But then I think also as agents and as their realtors, their exclusive buyer's agent or seller's agent, create the realistic expectation in the beginning to say, hey, if it's you're in a seller's market, I tell my clients, we're going to write a dozen offers. We're going to write a dozen. Is it If it's three or four, fantastic. But at least I, I create that expectation in the beginning. Yes. So now they understand it's a numbers game of offers that we write. And they're not that disappointed when we lose one or two and they're not going to social media and saying, Oh, my agent, the agent, the other Correct. agent, and all, you know, what, what can be done on, on the listing agent side to kind of just some transparency in the process, I think would help to, so that everybody feels like they got the fair shake at the, their, their own bite at the apple, if you will. Yeah. I don't, and, and uh, I would like to see agents a lot more, um, prepare both buyers and sellers 
for the actual negotiating piece. For instance, <clears throat> you know, the, if a seller is going to be in multiple offers, the first time that they've seen a contract or the first time that they've actually dealt with this is when a contract comes in. I think we as agents need to train them beforehand, you know, and, and it can be a simple conversation is, all right, let's talk about what kind of decision maker you are. or Let's talk about uh, what happens if you're going to receive two offers. All right. Mm -hmm. You get an offer that's full price. You get an offer that's a thousand over uh, full price and, you know, set them up. And then they go, well, I'm going to take the thousand over. It's like, okay, well, what happens if the full price is cash and the thousand's going to be uh, financed at 80% or a hundred percent? Right. Well, I don't know. What does that mean? I was like, well, these are, these are realistic scenarios. So I want to get their heads in the game before the game actually starts, as opposed to sitting down with two offers and then going, okay, these are these two offers where we can always go back to a reference point. Remember the conversation where we had about multiple offers or remember, because I think really if the more that we can prepare them for those multiple offer situations, the better offer we are. I mean, you know, you, you can deal with low ball offers, you can deal with different things like that because buyers, you know, even though it's a seller's market, buyers still think that they feel like they need to negotiate and, you know, I, I'm, I don't want to burn the calories and I know it's going to take two or three deals, but they're going to have to lose two or three deals. Well, why do I want to burn the calories to lose two or three deals when, so I may play a game with them beforehand. We'll say, okay, well, what do you want to offer here? Well, we'll offer 30,000 below. Really? Let's look at the comps here. We just lost that. You know, you can, you can kind of play those games with, with them and say, well, what's going to happen? You know, I always play the emotional card. You know, at what point is your wife not going to talk to you when you lose this house? What's the price there? That what's that mean? Right. You know? So, you know, we, and those are, those are really kind of some, some conversations, but I feel like these are, you know, 60, 90 second conversations that you can have with buyers and sellers that get their head in the game. I mean, that's what it's all about. And it saves a lot of time on the back end. Yeah, and, and I think you can teach the ABR class as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, where, where we kind of talk about if and when you can to try to present the offer in person. And on the listing side of it, if you're the listing agent, if I have multiple offers, I'm going to invite you to come present your offer in person. I have no problem with that. So then talk about transparency. We're at the office. There's three agents. They have three offers. They come, they present, they go back and sit down, and one of them, Gets, That's interesting. Gets the property, right? So that there's full transparency. Everybody understands that there's there was nothing that was done unfairly. Everybody was treated that you know fairly and honestly, and uh, we did everything that we could to, to that everybody felt like there was um, it was a, a level playing field, which I think sometimes with technology stuff is emailed and it's sent. And I know in in our New York City market, they actually have offer acknowledgement forms. So that the sellers have to sign them to be sure that the offer is actually presented in a multiple offer situation, you know, just to have that kind of transparency because there have been cases where stuff wasn't presented. Oh yeah. Well, we have a law in Louisiana that, that, uh, that, that actually NAR just, I'm not saying that they adopted our law, but they, they created a code of ethics piece just as well, where there actually has to be an acknowledgement from the seller. So uh, in Louisiana, either the seller marks it rejected or the agent will actually mark it rejected for the seller. And it has to be returned to the buyer within, uh, within um, a certain period of time. So it's, it's a it now is it used most of the time? No, but it, it, it certainly is something that's becoming a little bit more commonplace given our market. And well, you know, can can the agent lie about it? Sure, they can. But instead of just lying, they actually have to commit fraud, which is you know, it's a much bigger deal. <laughs> and then what's happening now is buyers, because clearly everybody's names on the contract, the buyers are contacting the sellers, going, "Why wouldn't my offer submit it?" And the sellers are going, "What offer?" And that's when you got the big problem. Right. That's when it hits the fan. Yeah, we, we've seen that here, where they just go and knock on the door and say, "Hey, why did you take our offer? Here it is." And the seller go, huh? Yeah, what are you talking about? Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, well, let's let's talk about social media groups. All right. You know, um, there's so many of them out there, and so many of them have good intentions of synergizing, networking, collaboration, helping you know, helping one another. Different companies. 
and they have different privacy settings. So you have an open group, you have a private group, and then you have a top secret group. Is that right? Three? Pretty sure that's it. And what I'm seeing, and I, I just can't believe what I see sometimes, just because you're in a top secret group doesn't mean that the code of ethics goes out the window. Agreed. Right. I mean, when you're when you're posting, uh, you know, I don't I don't think anybody is uh, is now ignorant to the fact that Facebook doesn't collect data and, and just assume that every group social media is social for a reason, you know, and I, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, posts inside of private groups that I'm not a member of. And that's exactly what's going to happen. People now are kind of pre-programmed to where they see something they don't like or they see something that's not uh, uh, that they don't feel is right. They're going to take us. A, a, they're going to screen grab it, screen capture, you know, do whatever they need to do. And it's going to be there forever. So, you know, just because it's in a private or a top secret group, just because it's within your company, I got a newsflash for you. Not everybody in the company gets along. So, uh, you know, to, to the extent that, that, uh, that they'll torpedo you that that'll happen too. So, it's a mistake to assume that private conversations are private. Let me give you an example. <laughs> Ticking time bomb here. So if uh, I, I'm going to put a post out that says, you know what? I, I looked at this listing. Look at how bad the photos are. I take the photos. I post them. I go, this is why it makes sense to work with my team because our photos are so great. What are, what are your thoughts on something like that? Um, I, I mean, forget the actual ethical implications there. I think it's bad form. Yep. Uh, I, I think, it, you know, I, it's there. there's better ways to promote you. You know, it, and it goes with anything. There's better ways to promote yourself than, okay. than to, you know, to step on somebody else's back or neck or stomach in order to prop yourself up. I don't know how the saying goes, but there's something along those lines. But, but, but the idea generally is, you know, you can promote how awesome your photographs are in your own listings instead of trashing somebody else's. So I, I don't, even as a joke, even as, you know, and, and, and I, I have a hard time stomaching a lot of those, a lot of those um, images. And let's be honest, some of them are hilarious. I, I don't, I don't disagree with they're funny, but I personally just don't think it's, it's going to be uh it, it, it should be a public display. It's not for you to decide what is and what isn't. I mean, if you've been in the business for any length of time, then you've shown a house, you're like, this is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. And your buyers turn around and think it's the greatest thing in the history of the planet. So, you know, I always kind of channel those emotions when we're talking about images. I mean, one man's trash is another man's treasure. So I just keep my mouth shut. What, what other kind of disparaging remarks are you seeing online about? I, I think what you're, I, I think what you're seeing is um, sometimes it's, it's uh, it always starts with an, with an image uh, or sometimes it starts with a phone conversation. And, and I kind of have a, have an issue with this where people kind of transcribe a phone conversation, me, you know, oh, yeah. listing agent, and, and they transcribe that. And then, that to my, I, I, I got a, I have a, I have an uneasy feeling about that as well. Um, because invariably you can be as generic as you want, or you can be as, as, um, as covert as you think you're being. Well, in the comments, somebody is going to go, Oh, I know that person. I know that company. And then uh, the question is, are you the one that's responsible? Cause you facilitated this conversation that disparaged an agent and, and what, what the agents say, well, Oh, I didn't name their company or I didn't name their name. But if they're identified all throughout the comments, then you, you kind of did. So for what that's, that's what, well, to what end, what, what's the end result of showing some ugly house? What, what do you expect to get out of that other than comparing you to somebody else? If, if your business isn't good enough to where you can't, rise above somebody else that everybody knows is terrible, then something wrong. Go sell cars. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, what I'd like to put out there is just, if you're going to, if, if you're about to post something, 
and it can be perceived. Just think of yourself from the consumer standpoint. If I'm going to read this post, what would I think about the real estate industry as a whole? Period. Answer that question. Yeah. If I hear you complaining about this agent didn't get back to me, uh, I wasn't treated right in this multiple offer situation. I think that this and on and on and on, whatever you're going to complain about, the public is like going to the middle of the mall and saying, hey, everybody, guess what? I think my other people that I work with are awful. Well, that's going to make everybody else think that our industry, uh, you know, just because it's one one interaction that you've had that wasn't to your liking, it's one out of a hundred. And, but that's what we're going to be judged on rather than all of the good things, all of the volunteer stuff, all of the charitable foundation stuff, all of the stuff that we do to make the industry great is what we need to be talking about. If you, if you have a complaint, go to your broker or go to your code of ethics board, right? I mean, sure. See something. And that's the issue is, is, uh, you know, and, and you can, you can post hello and that can be considered offensive to somebody because you didn't say hi or howdy or, whatever so oh, yeah, you know no. I, I, the whole the whole desire to be offended on social media again i i don't I, there's i have a lot of thoughts that i probably wouldn't say publicly about that but you know generally speaking it's it's it goes back to what your mom you know, taught you if you can't if you don't have anything anything nice to say then don't say it at all so i, I think there's a way that you can you can promote a sense of positivity and promote a sense of promote uh, the good that's going on in your world as opposed to the bad that may be going on in somebody else's. And it just, it doesn't make sense to me. It, it just doesn't make sense to me why somebody goes in that direction. And, and, and to your point, Jeremiah, they don't think about that. They don't think about the people don't think about the real estate industry. They think about their business and they don't even think about their company. They don't think about their team. They don't think about their broker. They think about their business, which I'm all for. I, I think you need to think about your business, but what you need to think about is the long-term implications of your business. So that's, that's my only issue with a lot of that is, you know, I, I want you to think about what you're doing to the real estate industry, but they're not, you're not, I don't. Uh, but when you post something, you go, okay, how's this going to look a year from now? How's this going to look when, and, and to your point, how's this going to look when the property doesn't sell, when we don't have any showings, how's this going to look to other buyers that are interested in this property? And I think that's kind of, the 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 train or at least the thought process that that we can sort of redirect in a pie in the sky world yeah all agents would think about the the real estate industry but it just it just doesn't happen that way we need to start okay how's this going to affect me and i'll tell you how it's going to affect you you know at a minimum it could be a code of ethics violation which are now going to be published uh, number two it could be a a license law violation depending on the state uh, and number three it's a it's you know it's time. It's a pain in the butt of stuff you don't even want to deal with. So if somebody has a complaint, I'm getting an echo. Turn your sound on. But if somebody does have a ethics complaint, just call your local real estate board and say, here's the scenario. Here's what I feel happened and, and, and take it from there. Call the local board. Call your local board of directors. Call somebody go to your broker go to your broker owner go to your manager but don't go to social media i guess is the moral yeah. of the story right if you're gonna if you're mad enough to complain then make the complaint yes. because if not if you don't i had a manager that told me this one time you have to inspect what you expect or you won't get respect sure you know so if like if, if you're wrong this time and you don't do something about it then you're gonna be wrong the next time by the same person unless you, you make a complaint about it so and that's what I love about teaching code of ethics courses is you talk about all of this and everybody brings it up and then sort of, uh, I, I go, all right, what are you going to do about it? And what does everybody in the class say? Nothing. I'm like really? Right. Well, if you want to change it, then there has to be uh, an issue. I taught a class in, uh, what was it? February, late January, where I had three uh, AEs at, on a panel. And I asked them, I said, how many calls do you get? that are complaints uh, about, you know, advertising ethical situations. They said, we get them all day long. And I said, well, how many, how many are actually filed complaints? And they said, well, we do three a year. I go, oh, so you get a call every day, but only three are filed a year. That's, you know, one, one board actually tracks them and they say less than 25%. 
you know, and these aren't, you know, humongous boards, but, but at the same time, it, it kind of goes to the point is if there's an issue, the only way that we can correct our industry from the inside out and the only way you can affect change is if somebody's doing wrong, then you have to make sure they're doing right. And it goes back to something I talked about in the beginning. I, I firmly believe that there are a lot of agents out there doing this that they don't even know that it's wrong. Right. And it's not, I, and, and a complaint is not necessary. And that's kind of what the ombudsman program is for. The complaint is not necessarily to say, you know, I want you to never do license. Uh, you, I never practice license activity again. The idea is to go, look, I just want you to know that you've done wrong. I don't, I don't think you need to get your license suspended. I don't even think we need to go to an ethics violation. Just acknowledge that you did something wrong. Acknowledge that you're not going to do it again and let's move on. I mean, that's kind of the idea of what the ombudsman is there. But if somebody doesn't know that they're doing wrong, they're going to continue to do it. And you know, these agents are going to sit there and stew about it. And that that's the part that kind of rubs me the wrong way is, is we need to start becoming that agent of change and fix our industry from the inside out. And it starts with just letting people know that, Hey, what you're doing is not right. Yeah. I mean, education is a big part of the process. So if it's somebody within your office, within, I mean, I, I don't even care if it's within the office. If it's anybody who's a fellow realtor, sometimes it just takes it like, Hey, Brent, you're my buddy. I don't know if you know this, but this is kind of frowned upon. Here's what you could do or should sure. do better next time so that, you know, we're all realtors. We all There's work. a right way to do that. And I mean, I've, I've listed property where somebody calls and says, look, man, the words you used here aren't good or, this is, not, you know, where it's just, it's, it's constructive criticism. And, and again, the, the flip side to that is a, we need to be able to present it in a positive way, but B, if somebody's trying to help you out, don't be a jerk about it, you know, sit there and go, okay, Hey, this is what I'm thinking, or I appreciate the constructive criticism or something of that nature. So a lot of that, a lot of that conversation can go both ways. And I know just my recent, not recent, but this was probably six months ago. I had a buyer that was looking for a multifamily in a nice area, what he considered was a nice area, not what I considered to be a nice area. And uh, just hard to come by. Yeah. And this property hits the market pending. And I, you know, I call the agent. I'm like, it's, I just, I'm sitting here on my computer. This just listed like 30 seconds ago. Oh, we have an accepted offer. And I'm like, how is that possible? I mean, you could see how the buyer might think that this was an illegal pocket listing or something was done, you know, and, he, and he's like, well, I've been in the business. I said, no, I'm not saying I'm not accusing you. What I'm saying is the buyer may have the perception and perception is reality that since yeah. we didn't have the opportunity to look at this and it's already pending that this is the scenario. And he, you know, after he calmed down a little bit that I can understand what you're saying. So then he lists one, the very next week in the same neighborhood. And I said, Hey, he goes, he was very um, forthcoming. Hey, Jeremiah, yes. look, there's somebody that looked at the house. They are interested in writing an offer. We don't have the offer yet because of that yeah. conversation that I had the week prior. Right. So it was a little bit uncomfortable at first, but then it helped make the communication, the dialogue so much better for our client you know, for our, our, our mutual clients benefit rather than, you know, on the backside, I hop on social media and go, I got screwed on this property. Right. I conversation with the guy. I, 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 and I, that's, that's how it needs to happen is it's just a simple conversation and, and, and both parties need to be aware. Look, I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you how to run your business and, and then, you know, we can come about it in a much better way. And then, from the flip side, you know, be able to receive those comments because if, if you're interested in making your business better, I want all comments, you know, I want to make sure that we do it right. One of the issues that we have with those pocket listings is appraisals. I mean, uh, we've had appraisers go, I'm not so sure that this has been exposed to the open market. So, I mean, when you have a, a you know, sold before entered into MLS or under contract before under MLS for $3,000 more than, uh, than the contract price, appraisers are taking a much harder look at those as well. So that would be my, that's my argument against the pocket listing aspect of it is you can, you can have a, a buyer there, but just make sure that the appraisers, the, the appraisal is going to work because I get calls and they don't, they don't really like them. 
Yeah, we're seeing it. I got a call yesterday from an appraiser. I'm representing the buyer and it was open market. Mm -hmm. You know, first week on, I'm not even sure if we had competition, but after a while, the buyers just say, you know what, let's go over asking because we don't yeah. want any other competition. Let's sure. convince them to cancel that open house and stop showing it, whatever they need to do to kind of encourage the seller to take it off the open market is, is what I, we're seeing buyers do because, you know, after you write three or four offers and you see a good value, you, you really want to get aggressive with it. But I had to have that conversation with the appraiser in order to help him realize why the buyers thought that was market value. Sure. No. Facts. I like it. All right. So I think we've been on for a little bit, Joe. Joe Sonona was commenting a little. He said brokers need to go back and get reeducated in all aspects of our business. Absolutely. Uh, but I don't again, think it would hurt. I mean, I, I think what one of the biggest keys from a brokerage standpoint for all you brokers out there is just encourage communication. I mean, I think a lot of times we we get in our bunker and and we're 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 so much so much more competitors now than we used to be. be. Um, I think there needs to be a spirit of cooperation and, and a spirit of that. And that that comes from the top down. And I think it comes from the leadership at the association level. I think it comes from a leadership, certainly at the brokerage level. And if agents can see brokers talking to one another in a spirit of cooperation, I think that example really can, can help have those conversations as well. Because right now you're looking, you know, as these different business models and as these different companies are coming into markets and, and being bought out and gobbled up and combined and separated and however you see it, there's, and, and, you know, you look at our country's landscape and you almost have to choose a side, even though you don't care about the sides. Um, and I think it's, it's affecting really all aspects of our business, but there should be a time where we can come together and have an honest dialogue. And I think it should come to, to Joe's point. It should come from the brokerage level. And if brokers can have an honest conversation and say, look, you know, we've had this issue with your agent, I think they're a great guy. I think they do super work, but I'd prefer them not do this. And you know, this could potentially be a code of ethics issue. You right. know, I'm not trying to affect any business, but just, just know that it's wrong. And again, be able to give that, that advice in a nice way. And, and the hard parts receiving constructive criticism in a nice way. But if they can, if brokers can have that effect, I think it'll trickle down to the agent side. I've been accused of being a Pollyanna. So that's, uh, that's my, that's my hope. Well, and if they don't, that's what the code of ethics is for. That's where they need the, the arbitration. I, I tried and I failed. So now we're going to go to the next step. Well, and I think we have so many great leaders out there, especially, you know, younger, we're talking about like on the national level, YPN, the YPN groups, like if you're involved with leadership or you're the leader of a group, in any way, shape or form, like if you have to be the change, you have to set the example, you have to lead from the front and say, I can't, I can't get on here now and say, Brent, we should do something about it. And then if something happens to me tomorrow, I'm just like, oh, well, I got to do a deal with that guy the next sure. day. No, you, you have to do something. That's the only way things are going to change. It may be uncomfortable for a little bit, but we'll get through it. Just like Brent said, it's, you know, it's an education process, either from the broker standpoint, or sometimes when the agents are going up, to the broker and saying, Hey, here's an issue. Maybe it's something that he realizes from a training standpoint, he needs to re-educate his entire brokerage on if it's a sure. couple of agents that are coming in and explaining it to him. So be the change. That's going to be our message. Be the change. Oh, we're typing now. Got it. Anything you want to say in closing? No. You'll be better today than you were yesterday. That's right. Focus on progress, not perfection. Yeah, man. And if you have any other hot topics you want us to talk about, just comment below, share this. And to anybody else you think might need some social media ethics education or just some education in general. Uh, this That's is right. Ed Talks. And Brent, thank you so much again. Thanks, Jeremiah. I appreciate it, man. Yep. Have a great day. We're we'll going to talk to you soon. Sign off. Yeah.